Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm a librarian at Coquitlam Public Library. Uh, joining me today is Bill Burnett, uh, the astronomer. Uh, welcome Bill and thank you for coming to join us. I'm going to provide just a little bit of a preamble about what we're doing. Uh, the program that we're doing today is called Astronomy at Home and it's going to be a weekly series uh, featuring recordings in which we're talking about uh, the night sky uh, and things that you can look up and see uh, using everyday objects, or if you happen to have a telescope, you can focus on different things in the sky. And for today, I think we're going to start a little bit about uh, speaking about the background uh, of Bill, uh, so you get to know him a little bit. And then we're going to go through a few questions and get to some ideas about things you can, you can look at towards the end of the interview. We're aiming for about a 20-minute interview. Uh, we're going to start, first of all, with how we know Bill. So Bill has come to visit the library on, uh, on a few occasions for special events that we've held. And we brought him in with a really cool thing, uh, a mobile planetarium that's inflatable. And he has brought that in on a couple of occasions. And he's inflated it inside the library. And it's just created this big dome. And he has a projector that casts an image up towards the top of the dome while people are seated inside it. So it's perfectly dark inside the, inside the dome, all the light is shut out, and then the, uh, the dome camera uh, creates a planetarium uh, inside that little dome. And we've used that um, to provide kids with information, education about astronomy. Bill's been, he's told them stories, he's shared facts about things in the solar system and zipped them off to see different planets. And it struck us not just how neat the technology was, but how good a storyteller Bill was um, to kids of different ages, uh, but he can scale his talks to speak to people, to anyone. He can speak to teenagers and, and adults and people who are experts in the field and people who are lay people. And so we thought it would be a great idea while a whole bunch of things are closed during the COVID crisis and while a lot of people are at home, some of them looking for things to do, that we could bring him in and speak with him about one of the things that they can do, which is uh, sort of admire, uh, admire things in the night sky. And so we're gonna get, we're gonna launch into the interview portion of it now. And I've got a few prepared questions. We'll see where they lead. Uh, but I'll start off with the very first one. Uh, Bill, how did you first become interested in astronomy as a topic? Well, <clears throat> Chris, uh, I guess uh, um, it, uh, uh, it just seemed uh, something I kind, of, I kind of fell into. I don't know how exactly. I got a couple of books early on um, and, and sought out more books on astronomy. And uh, after a while, I got to be curious about what it would look like myself. So I went out and uh, looked around with my binoculars and then got a small telescope. So things sort of um, evolved from there. So you don't need a lot of equipment if you're going to be interested in astronomy. Um, a few books, a star map, a pair of binoculars, and um, a nice location where you're away from city lights or the city lights are dimmed or, or, uh, or somehow it's darker than the rest of the community. Um, that's a place to go to, uh, to see uh, the nighttime sky. And after a while, you start out, you learn the constellations and then, um, the names of the stars, and then uh, some deep sky objects like star clusters or nebula, and where the planets go, and the planets uh, move around, and you can follow them. And after a while, it all begins to make sense, and the sky is as familiar as the houses on your block. So, you now you started off. Uh, you had an interest in astronomy, and I'm guessing that may have started when you were maybe when you were young. I think that's that's fairly typical, but. You can share a bit about that if you want, but then for a long time, uh, you weren't active in astronomy. You were working in uh, a different type of work. I think you were a journalist for a long time. So tell us a little bit about that background and then how you segued from journalism uh, into astronomy. Well, I, uh, it's tr true. I was a journalist uh, for a number of years, and um, although I didn't cover science as such, um, I, I did... Uh, uh, I was uh, a journalist during the uh, 1986 um, Halley's Comet apparition. So I wrote a, a couple of stories on the comet and um, then uh, got, I sort of got 
more and more interested in it. And then I approached the Macmillan Planetarium and um, I got a, a job there. And so I, I managed to go from journalism to astronomy. But because most of the things I did were in the classroom and required communication skills, I used the journalism skills of writing and such to uh, give me a leg up. Uh, because many people know something about astronomy, but um, not everyone can communicate um, accurately or uh, popularly, I suppose, uh, what they know. And so uh, sometimes you meet um, astronomers who are very clever and, uh, uh, and make uh, great discoveries and things like that, but they're really not at home in a classroom unless they're talking to their peers or graduate students or people like that. For the general public, they, they're not that comfortable with. Whereas um, I, I do all, all my work really with the general public and uh, or at school students. So, so it, sort of, it sort of was a good match. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like the communication skills you did, you developed uh, sort of writing and speaking uh, skills through journalism really played a key role uh, in what your early work was with uh, H.R. McMillan. Um, um, how, how long did you end up working uh, for H.R. McMillan before you moved, sort of struck out on your own uh, as an astronomer? Um, I was at McMillan for about 20 years, right? So during that time, uh, things changed a great deal in communicating astronomy. So the digital uh, planetariums uh, were invented and became common, whereas before that time, the uh, the traveling planetarium was just a um, like a light bulb um, in a transparency. So it was a it was not a, a computer or a digital mode. It was uh, much simpler than that. Um, but yet it was quite effective in its way, and uh, and uh, we we did uh, do some uh, a lot of work with it. But when the digital computers came and uh, the planetariums became digital, it was a lot better because um, the history of what is going to happen. Uh, in the sky can be is programmed into the uh, computer so you can move and see what's going to be going on in six months or a year or five years or 50 years even whereas with the analog system basically you were just showing a sort of a sampling of the sky and it wasn't it couldn't be made up to date very easily so and so in other words the time element was missing in the old-fashioned um, analog uh, method of doing it. So it was a big jump up and became a lot better and more um, interactive with the kids. So they could ask a question, what's going to happen on my birthday? And the, the computer can answer that by showing the sky on their birthday. Yeah. Now, did the, did the advent of that new technology make it easier then for you to kind of break away? Did you see the potential then to, to form, to form your own, your own thing? You formed your own business ultimately to, uh, yeah. to, to, to share astronomical knowledge and to take the planetarium around to all sorts of places uh, as, a, as an educational boon? Well, it, it's, uh, it was a big leg up and uh, wherever we go in the, uh, uh, in the school systems, it's very popular and, and we'll always get very good comments about it. So it's, um, uh, it's something that's ongoing now. Of course, it's all in limbo because of the current uh, pandemic, but um, I'm hoping that the schools will come back and then we'll return to the things as normal with the portable planetarium. Although obviously I have no idea when that is going to happen. Um, and I guess nobody does. So, but we're ready when it does. <laughs> now you mentioned the pandemic. Um, that's maybe a topic to touch on now because I have uh, read and heard uh, that the night sky is clearer than it has been at, at many points in the past at this time of year. Uh, mm -hmm. Due to the fact that not as many people are on the road, so there isn't as much exa exhaust, there isn't as much smoke going up from businesses and maybe factories mm -hmm. as there would normally be. Uh, have you noticed any differences like that in the lower mainland when you've looked up in the sky? Yeah, well, in fact, I have. Um, uh, it has made a difference because I can see um, objects with my binoculars that I couldn't see before. Um, so star clusters that I wasn't able to spot I can now see just vaguely as a little puff of light um, in some of the constellations and the 
explanation for this and why they're suddenly visible is that there must be less particulate matter in the atmosphere, which is uh, because of there's less uh, less automobile traffic, factories, uh, businesses that have smokestacks and things like that. So all of these things together make for a clearer sky, and uh, and it is noticeable uh, even at the uh, binoculars. Yeah, that's right. When people are at home and knowing that they can use objects as simple as binoculars to study objects in the night sky, uh, what are some of the things around this time, uh, time of year, uh, about you know mid-May right now, that would be good for people to try to focus in on uh, up on the sky on a clear night? Well, um, I guess uh, high in the west is Castor and Pollux. They're uh, a bright pair of stars and one of these stars is quite orange. So if you take a look with your binoculars, you'll see it's markedly different from the other star, uh, which is whitish. So this sort of orange star, uh, Pollux, and the Castor, the whitish star, make a nice kind of a contrast. Then as uh, they begin to set, then on the other side of the sky, up comes the Summer Triangle. So the Summer Triangle is a, a triangle of stars. They're all whitish, um, and they make a triangle that points kind of towards the south. Uh, the southernmost one is Altair, and it has uh, a, a companion star on each side of it. So there's a trio there, and Vega is very bright and gets very high up in the sky. Um, so that those are some of the things that can be spotted. Vega is kind of light blue, like a very faded blue jeans color, and and, uh, uh, and so it's a, uh, it's a it's one of the brightest stars in the sky. Now, when you look up at the sky, just with the naked eye. Um, except if it's an especially dark night or maybe a new moon or something like that, I find that the, the stars just come through. I, I'm not able to kind of make out the colors clearly, but do you find with, with just the magnification of the binoculars that you're able to make out those things in a more distinct way, that it's a kind of a difference in terms of how you observe them? You can pick up those additional details? Well, the colors make um, uh, are seen better in binoculars simply because the binoculars are bigger than your eyes, so they grab more light. So the more light you get in, the more likelihood the, uh, the, the uh, rods and cones in your eye will be excited and you'll be able to see in color. So the, the colors do come out better when you're using even small binoculars. And... Um, and so this is, uh, this is the best way to, to look at uh, some of these colored stars. Later on, the star Antares comes up and low in the south, and it's very, very orange. And that marks the beginning of the summer season for observing. Yeah. Now, I was going to ask as well, we've spoken yeah. a little bit about stars and colors of stars, which would be something that I think uh, people would, would they be interested to see. Uh, to be able to sort of make out or, or distinguish colors between different stars because I think probably a lot of people think of a lot of stars of being uh, lay people of, of them being the same color because you look up in the sky and they look mostly kind of like you know white and tinkly uh, until you have a, a closer look at them and are able to bring them up with greater magnification. Uh, so we've talked a bit about stars. What about a planets? Where are where are planets okay. visible right now? Are, are, and are any of them in their, in their particular orbits particularly visible uh, at this time of year? Well, um, Jupiter and Saturn are both visible, but they're low in the sky. So you have to be in a place where you have a good southern horizon. Uh, Jupiter is very bright, and Saturn is a bit fainter, but still noticeably bright, and they're fairly close together. So you might be able to see them in the same binocular field, uh, with a good pair of binoculars because they're they're not very far apart. What's happening is Jupiter will slowly overtake Saturn and pass it. And that's because Jupiter goes around the sun in about 12 years. Saturn takes about 30 years to go around. So every 20 years, Saturn catches up and passes um, uh, uh, Saturn. So that um, this will happen this year in 2020 as it happened 20 years ago in, in the year 2000. So both the planets will be very close together and uh, now you can't see their structure just with binoculars but a small telescope will show that Jupiter has a, uh, a, a group of moons that are going around it for uh, moons kind of in a straight line usually they look like dots and of course Saturn with uh, at least 30 or 35 power you can see um, that it has a little ring a little loop all the way around it um, both of them are kind of vaguely yellowish in color and as I say Jupiter is very bright 
but and Saturn is not quite so bright, but still it's noticeable as uh, as a planet because it doesn't twinkle very much and looks kind of similar to Jupiter, but it's uh, not quite as colored. Yeah. All right. With regards to the planets and the uh, and the stars that you've mentioned so far, um, if people are trying to locate them in the sky, are there any tools they can use online that will tell them kind of uh, like a particular uh, segment or area of the sky to look in? I know that you've mentioned uh, some of the some of the places to sort of study them, but are there are there astronomical tools that they can refer to to discover Antares or to to see if they can they can locate uh, Jupiter in the night sky right now. Well, the um, uh, Sky Safari is uh, is an app for uh, uh, for a cell phone, and that will uh, if you point the uh, device at the sky, it will identify which is Jupiter, which is Saturn. Another thing is a planisphere, which is a, a piece of a little piece of paper um, that turns around and around and matches you match the day of the year. Um, to the hour, and it will give you a picture um, of the sky, north, south, east, and west. So that's another way of, uh, of finding where these objects are. Um, but basically, in the summer, they'll be low in the south, and there's not a great deal of bright stars in their neighborhood. So the pair that are reasonably bright, and one of them being very bright, um, they're kind of by themselves. Those are the two planets, and they remain there in the summer and in the fall, sort of side by side. Uh, for for the next little while. Yeah. I know that at certain times of year there are sometimes meteor showers in the sky. I don't know what the timing is for those. I think that there are some in the some in the spring and some in the in the fall. Uh, right. Are there any any of those upcoming? Have those passed? Um, are well, the the um, <coughs> the meteors um, will come in August. The uh, the um, the Perseid meteors are, are an August event, so that's a little bit further on. But uh, in the first week, uh, end of the first week in August, generally there's more shooting stars, and then there's a kind of a peak. Uh, it depends how uh, on where the moon is, uh, whether you'll see more or or less uh, of the shooting stars. Because um, if there's a lot of moonlight, it will disguise the fainter ones. If the moon is absent, then you'll see more. So it depends really where the moon is um, at the peak in early August. Right. But uh, it is worth going outside and uh, taking a look uh, up and uh, seeing if you can see shooting stars. If you have a deck chair, take the deck chair out, lie in the, on the deck chair under the nighttime sky. And um, in the peak, you might see as many as, as a dozen or so um, shooting stars in an hour. Yeah. Now, the, uh, the library has, uh, you, you attended the opening that we had where we revealed that we have small telescopes that people can uh, can loan out. Um, you had mentioned earlier that using uh, a, even a relatively small telescope, you could focus in on some of the planets and possibly make right. out the location of some of the moons. Do you think that would be possible with the, with the simple telescopes that we have available for people to take home? Jupiter would certainly be uh, um, on hand with its moons in the little telescopes. That's right. The ring of Saturn is a little bit more difficult, but even if it isn't visible, when you look at Saturn and focus uh, carefully, you'll notice that it's not round. It's kind of elliptical, like a, like a dinner plate that is being held at an angle. So that's because it has a ring that's going around it, and so it looks longer on one axis than the other. Right? So that can certainly be seen, too, in, in the little telescopes. Okay, and I think we've we've reached a point now. We've been speaking for about twenty minutes, and that's kind of our, our target time for these broadcasts. Okay. So, um, what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to thank Bill uh, for for joining us this week. But our plan is to keep this ongoing as a as a series in which we check in with him and look for other. Uh, tips and ideas about using uh, back uh, using simple objects for stargazing and, and staring up uh, at the sky. Uh, one of the things that I think we can maybe touch on a little bit next time, maybe we can talk a little bit about studying the moon and when are good moon, times okay. to look at, at, at phases of the moon. So that'll be something to look forward to okay. uh, the next time uh, we, we okay. tune in. And we're planning to have these recordings go up at about the same time each week. So I think 
Uh, this one should be Friday afternoon, and hopefully every Friday after that, we'll be able to see new content like this. Um, I want to thank Bill so much. So Bill Burnett, the astronomer, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Thanks, I'm Chris, Chris and uh, I'm a librarian at Coquitlam Public Library. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the content. We hope that you tune in to see uh, our shows uh, in the subsequent weeks as we talk more about astronomy. Okay.